You know, it's not very often that I have someone who has two PhDs in the work, world of academia to come on and talk about something that is so very important to almost all of us. And so I'm incredibly excited to have Dr. Emily Barnes here today talking about the safety measures for bias in AI, which is something, to be honest, was not even on my radar. I am so excited to talk to you about this, Emily. Thank you so much for taking the time. Ah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. And so this is based in the research. It's based in what you have been learning and studying, consulting, experiencing, teaching, mm -hmm. um, very much entrenched in over the last so many years. And so before we start talking about this, can you tell me a little bit about what inspired you to become an expert in artificial intelligence as it relates to uh, bias? Oh, that's a, well, that's a great question. I, I don't know if I have a, gosh, a direct immediate answer. It was more or less something that I think grew over time as situations changed and you know, the economy and technology grew. Um, I've always had a, uh, regardless of me working in higher education for years, I have always had a, f a focus on technology or seen most activities or most um, most of the areas I was working on projects were, was through the lens of technology. And I think with AI, it's just, it was a natural progression um, to <laughs> embrace this the space next um, with the different generations of technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it seems like you're really out ahead of this. And so, which is incredibly, incredibly important. And, you know, uh, as far as safety measures and bias in general, I, I don't even know if I even thought about bias as there even being safety measures, but I do know from a, you know, wearing coaching, you know, mm -hmm. dozens of, you know, female executives and also hundreds of their direct reports that that there is a safety issue, even without AI, it comes with emotional tax, it comes with just the stress and pressures that women, especially women who are further marginalized within our gender are experiencing mm -hmm. in the workplace. But now you add in AI, what are a couple of the things that we need to be very, very worried about and aware of so we can come up with solutions with in terms of uh, safety measures and AI in terms of bias? So I love this question uh, because <laughs> while, even while you were asking it, you know, I was I was thinking of one of these really important things everybody could do. And I think it comes to uh, one key area that we got to look at prior, you know, and that is you know, looking at the, the dangers, the risk factors that are out there, it's really based on, or I would say it's more central to how it affects society and how it affects people within it. Because just like our family structures do generations upon generations, um, key elements can linger throughout these different phases of people, right? So maybe the mindset of your grandparents, you know, you still hold some of those things, but um, it has still stuck through the generations, very similar technology, um, especially in the world of AI, because of how we train AI models to work, the legacy data and some of the legacy biases that would have entered into AI back in the 50s and 60s still linger into those iterations today. So for instance, if machine learning came to us in the 50s and 60s, then generative AI that's here now still might hold some of those uh, lingering um, breadcrumbs of bias that that's now lasted throughout this time. And because AI is now, I would say, cradling our information and how we move forward, we're using it for all different types of applications. And, um, you know, as far as applying it to different functionalities at work and different types of industries, you know, what is still in there um, that's affecting how we interact and the information that is being delivered and created through AI today. Um, so the reason why I think safety is so important is that all of us have a chance now to say, how can we best address how AI works and 
how I'm applying it to my job and my home and my life so that I am protecting future me um, from mm -hmm. an AI that's been trained on biased data. Mm -hmm. so what happens 50 years from now? What, what's the world look like for my children, my daughters? Um, knowing that the same medical data sets that we might have that's influencing uh, maybe recommended treatments today were created 30 the years ago, 20 years ago. And if we don't start putting things in place now, you compound that to another 30, 40 years. How does that impact how these systems work, you know, well beyond today? Uh, because they, it will stay um, as far as how bias can transcend throughout these different technologies. And I think that that's really something that um, it's like the, uh, the reason behind the, mm -hmm. the danger is that if we're not cognizant of this, of this happening, then what happens when it's even further along down the road? Mm -hmm. And can you give us a real life example? I mean, you talked about like clearly in the medical field, mm -hmm. you know, there's new research coming out all the time. And so obviously it would be very detrimental to be, mm -hmm. you know, have AI, like old AI, you know, trying to come up with current solutions. But what about in our corporate companies? You know, what is a real life example of where, you know, lack of a safety measure for, you know, for bias and AI could really be detrimental? Can I give you, is it okay to give a real example, like an actual sure. real one? I might have to drop a name of a company. So uh, not too long ago, um, this is, it, it gained a lot of attention. It was, um, it was Amazon's uh, selection criteria. It was an algorithm that was used to vet and verify applications um, for positions that they had at the company. And because the because the model was trained on historical data that was largely male or uh, more predominantly male, um, the algorithm would automatically favor um, male applicants. Um, so if in that particular model, you know, if it picked up words like, women's colleges, women's associations, things like that, it would automatically reject the the application or reject the CV or the resume because it was trained on data that favored male language, male training, male education, male experiences from, you know, a data set that would have been 10 years of data where more men happen to apply than, than women. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, think about like the evolution of work and women in the workplace. You know, most of us, if we look at our mothers, some of them may have been uh, full-time work. A lot of them may have been home and then, you know, their children um, more at work, more not, but how many women were really at a, a high level, you know, filling these high level roles um, where they could have pulled data from multiple female applicants when really there may not mm -hmm. be as many. So we got to give them the benefit of the doubt there. But also the model simply wasn't trained um, to be unbiased in selection. So it was automatically pulling out, you know, male resumes for these positions and ignoring female for this, for that reason. So that's a mm -hmm. very tangible, you know, what are the dangers? Imagine applying and because you're female or, you know, the, or because you're part of a women's association or went to a women's college, you know, you were automatically ruled out just because of a machine. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, and I would, I would imagine that if it's being women are being pulled out, then it probably goes deeper into possibly affecting women who are further marginalized or just, there's probably many, you know, mm -hmm. layers to the, the danger of this potential bias. And so when it comes to our companies, you know, well, two two prong question. One is, what's one thing that our you know the companies you know can do in mm -hmm. order to you know update this or to you know really help um, you know I don't say help fight it, but you know help bring current this very important issue. Mm -hmm. And you know what is the you know the consequence. You know, if they if it's not addressed it and, and, and who would do it? Is this a chief digital? You know, is it an I like mm -hmm. who's the the person that needs to take the lead on this? Well, if you're asking me, uh, two people need to take the lead on this. It's you, whoever you may be. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then the person who is the lead of the company. Um, I think it's a top down approach as far as just like a D, 
a DEI initiative, just like a change in culture or, um, you know, trying to lead a new strategy. AI, um, AI strategy at right now should be on everyone's list of, you know, what are we discussing as far as our, in our rooms of strategy, right? Or among our council or our boards or um, our, um, around the leadership table, you know, what are we discussing? AI should be on everyone's top of mind at this point. Um, that's a very strong opinion from from my perspective, mm -hmm. um, considering how much is going to be altering industries, but also just everyday interactions and how we we work together. Um, also, you know, how we verify information and, and understand our data, and which will also influence our business strategy. So looking at this from a, a very broad scope across many industries, you know, one, I think that having the conversation is a very small little baby step that everybody can start doing um, is starting to have these conversations, lunch and learns, trainings, chatter. I don't care if it's like, you know, water cooler chat or if it's, you know, also in the boardroom, uh, but having these conversations about how AI is going to influence our company and influence our business and influence how we work. And, you know, what are all the, what are all the things that might residually rub into that, which is going to be everything. Right. But having, um, having those conversations are important, but then other, other little small things, um, putting together a AI task force or strategy council or, um, working group, you know, who are now going to be assessing different areas of the, of your business, um, all the way from your marketing to day-to-day -day operations. And then, you know, even how you follow up with, with old customers and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It could be, um, you know, or even how we train our staff, um, newcomers, how we bring them into the company, how we make them feel at home, different things that we can do, enable remote work, for instance, or make us more efficient and better at what we do. Um, but having these groups work on these things. Um, another one is going to be making sure that group, as well as all other groups, you know, I'll just ask you the question. If you look at your IT department, who's in your IT department? Generally, you know, you don't have to answer, but mm -hmm. I think we can all think about, mm -hmm. you know, visualize your current, who is helping you with your technology? Who is, who's answering the phone? Who is uh, going to be fixing those problems? So get that, get those people in your mind, right? Right now, only 26% of those people across the globe are women mm -hmm. um, overall. So representation is still very low and very poor and how that can impact everything from choosing a system to how it's being used to, you know, how it's even the terminology, I mean, you name it, all these different mm -hmm. aspects, making sure that there are or that there is representation of women, uh, people of color, people from different backgrounds, different groups will help mitigate bias. Um, also having those teams interact with company data. So think about like an AI task force that now has equal representation and they are ensuring that one, they're reviewing policies and practices that might need to be addressed. How can they, um, how can their role influence data governance or data strategy, data management storage, you know, how are we ensuring that our data sets are unbiased? How are we making sure we have representation? You know, for example, um, IBM, it, so the company IBM um, is called IBM Watson. It was for oncology. So imagine a, a system that is designed to help recommend, di or recommend treatments for cancer that's been trained on all American hospitalized data or hospital data. You know, you're looking at who's been diagnosed with cancer over the past 10 years, 20 years, um, and who's, who's had deaths from it. And then how do we recommend treatment? So then imagine that system being trained on American or data from American hospitals, not equal representation considered. Think about who is the old, you know, think about how many people have cancer, what are their demographics? And now their bodies and their conditions are influencing um, alternative, you know, whether or not alternative medicine is going to be, effective, you know, so think about people who mm -hmm. are from across different places of the world. Um, think about, um, you know, those that might um, not have that, that same kind of body, that same type of background, whatever it may be. Um, that since the data is now skewed, it's going to be recommending things that are very American or very common mm -hmm. to America, body types, body heights, body, mm -hmm. you know, all of it. Um, so having, having checks and balances in place, um, for the data that we're training our systems mm -hmm. on is very important in demanding that transparency 
when working with a company or a group of people or a service of some sort. If you know mm -hmm. AI is, is here, demand transparency. So you know, mm -hmm. how is this data verified for bias? Mm -hmm. um, so that goes into also having regular measures for testing and, and um, auditing. So if you're a business that is interacting with AI at all or processing large data sets at all or working with big data, you have a CRM, you have any of those things where you're now looking at data for strategy or how to put in predictive measures for where you're going to go with your company or where mm -hmm. you've been trying to understand these things. You know, what's the process for auditing? What's the process for verifying whether the data is biased or not or is representing your true customers or not? Now, historical data can be tricky because a lot's changed in the past five, 10 years, mm -hmm. especially globalization. So having those measures in place. And then the last one, I guess the big one would be having that inclusive design, um, meaning now stepping back, look at your business holistically. Where do you need inclusivity around technology um, and not just technology as far as what we're using every day, like our machines and phones, but in how your business performs, how it runs. Mm -hmm. um, and what are you losing because you're not putting these things in place? Um, you might pull the last five years of customer data. Who bought my product? Who's bought my services? Where do they live? You know, you know what are their, what information is there? You name it. What have they purchased? How much they, how many times they purchase it? Um, those people, if you take a look in, through history and you're trying to determine your next move, um, that those people represent who you want in the future. You know, do you want the last 10 years look at the next? Um, if that's guiding your advertising strategy, for instance, you know, what are you missing out on because you didn't make mm -hmm. sure that, that information was unbiased? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so many things to consider. And I have to ask this question because especially uh, for, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, for individuals who have been executives in U.S. companies or in global companies for decades and decades and decades, this is likely on their radar because it has to be if they watch the news or if they're paying attention. Um, but what is the number one risk if they're like, I know it's here, I know it's coming, I know we need to do something. But when it comes to revenue and growth, and the viability of companies and the growth of companies and their abilities to do what they're supposed to do and report to their boards. And, you know, what is the number one risk of not making sure that there are safety measures in place for bias in AI? So I, I think, um, gosh, there's so many layers to this, you know, what's the societal impact? What's the impact to my revenue, to my reach? Um, and I could go on about that for a really long time and pick that mm -hmm. apart, but I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, the number one risk, you know, if you look at it from a societal perspective, let's, let's go large and let's come, let's come down from a societal perspective. Um, it's, it, it, it is unwittingly, you know, baking in bias for the next several generations to deal with, um, because we didn't want to approach it. Um, you know, I think we have to realize that right now we're working with a, a tool that can be used to make money. We're look, looking at a tool that can help shape laws, policies, how we do business, how we interact with our customers, how we think about service. I mean, you name it, everything's impacted. And now we are, are we willingly allowing a human made system, a human -made process shape what we're capable of for the next several years you know so are we willing to um, allow our business you know to it's, it's going to sound kind of funny to say it this way but are we are we going to allow our our business to be you know strung along you know kicking and screaming right or are we going to willingly embrace this as we would any other substantial change in technology that we now have to utilize and, and take care of and, and be mindful of with our company. Um, you know, having the, are we, are we moving along with this, with this huge trend or are we self-leading? Are we, are we really running, you know, our company? Are we really, um, I'm trying to really get to that, that key moment, but it's like, are you following along and letting this guide you or 
are you going to take lead in how you want this tool um, to optimize and impact your business for good, right? And I think that one of the worst things that can happen right now or the biggest risk factor is, is taking this apathetic approach um, or taking a blind eye um, and not really addressing it head on um, because, and it doesn't have to be scary, but it's not something that will ever go away. At this point, we're at the point of no return, right? We passed mm -hmm. the infection point. Um, things really won't go back. AI is really not going to go back in the box. Um, you know, there's plenty that would argue that it's not even possible for it to go back into the box. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we got to own our role in the process as well of, mm -hmm. of how, how we work with society. So I think risk overall is just not being part of it and, um, not being a leader in it and just letting it be something that consumes us. And I think that for any business owner or professional, it's, you know, how do you want, what can you do with AI to um, optimize your business, your profession, your way of, of interacting with, you name it, right? So how are you using it versus what is it doing to me? Yeah, a hundred percent. It doesn't seem like a stretch, you know, the, in the McKinsey reports over the years and certainly the most recent one, as far as the women in the workplace, um, report, you know, it's clear that, um, you know, that diversity in the workplace, it's good for business. And so mm -hmm. it's probably, I would imagine, not a stretch to think that if these safety measures that you're talking about um, to address bias in AI are not addressed and not, you know, companies or non-leaders are not mm -hmm. proactive about it. It is, there is a philosophical and moral fallout but there's also a business impact as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, and then if you were to leave us with, you know, one, you know, nugget or of wisdom or thing to keep in mind or a thing to think about so we can take, pers you know, personal responsibility for ourselves to take safety measures for bias and AI or for our companies, what would you say that would be? Yeah, I think it's, it, you know, really simple. Um, take inventory of everywhere in your life where you see AI impacting it already. That could be your AI on your kitchen ca uh, kitchen counter, um, or you know your whatever chat bot at work that you might be using, or something that's helping you, mm -hmm. you know, not miss commas. And then um, knowing that you are embracing this technology through using it, or having it in your home, or having it in your car, or wherever it may be. Um, what do you know about its data? You know, do you take note of, do I know how this works? Do I know how it, um, you know, how is it delivering a message? So what is my, 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 what's the word? My final, final message would be to um, understand where AI is. And if you are seeking transparency and if you are seeking, um, a level of service as far as you know what you know about AI, like what as far as the service that you're paying for, or the people that you're working with, or the product that you're buying. Um, know that the one message that every consumer has, whether it's professional or not, is where you put your time and your dime. And it's a little simple, but you know if if people are wanting that transparency from companies and they want um, to have a more ethical AI free of bias, then you have to demand that. And sometimes the most powerful thing we have is where we put our attention and where we put our money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's something that we can do personally and something that companies, mm -hmm. it seems like, need to be very aware of. And that will probably be heightened and that awareness will be heightened in the future. So if it's not a real risk now, it seems like it could be in mm -hmm. the future as far as to revenue and impact that our companies are having. So. Dr. Emily Barnes, thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom and all of these, uh, your knowledge on AI as it impacts our, you know, the safety measures that we and our companies need to have, getting ahead of it as we move into the future and learning how to work with AI, keeping ourselves and our communities and our companies safe. I look forward to following your journey and I really appreciate your time here with us today. Ah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.